I had a viewer ask me to go kind of around my lab and talk about each of my instruments. And um, I thought about doing that, but uh, and I still might do that someday, but I think I want to do a, a slightly different version of that topic uh, today. Um, and I don't know if it's going to be a one-part video, a two-part video, it depends on, on how quickly we can get through this. Um, but that is kind of, um, if you're going to be setting up an electronics lab, uh, what instruments do you need? And uh, I try to like to give an example of a cheap solution and uh, kind of a high-end solution. Um, and those two terms are relative, you know, what, what is cheap to one person or what is expensive to one person. But, but basically I'll show you two versions, you know, a lower end version and, and a higher end version. And uh, I thought about trying to make the list myself, but I know there's already a list in existence. So we're going to use a list in a book, okay? Remember books? <laughs> so let's go take a look at this book. So this book is called Troubleshooting Analog Circuits, and it's written by a famous engineer, uh, Bob Pease. I don't know if anybody called him Robert, but anyway, Bob Pease. And um, he's a, he was a character. Um, and he wrote a lot of articles for various uh, magazines, stuff like EDN, there was something called the Peace Porridge. And um, anyway, he has this great book. I, I recommend this book if you want to learn analog circuits and stuff. So he has a chapter here on uh, choosing the right equipment. So I thought I would just go down Bob's list of equipment, okay? And uh, we'll, just, we'll just go through them. There's, let's see, one, two, three, four, uh, let's see how many things he has here, 17. He has uh, 28. He has 28 things that you need. <laughs> so I don't know if we'll go through all of them. But uh, yeah, let's go through it one by one. And uh, the first he has listed here is a dual, dual trace oscilloscope, all right? And uh, he talks about the qualifications of the scope that you need. Um, so um, this is an example of a high-end scope, okay? I paid $900 for this scope, and um, a lot of people are not going to be able to spend that kind of money. I, I didn't for a long, 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 long time. And it wasn't until I made some money on uh, ad revenue from my YouTube that I was able to afford something like this. And, uh, but you can get really nice oscilloscopes pretty cheap these days. Try to find yourself, I think, a 100 megahertz oscilloscope. Um, you need at least 20 megahertz. So I would, and, and that's like super easy to find. Um, so on the low end, look, first, of, first and foremost, I think, look for a used oscilloscope. Uh, um, especially if you're just kind of getting into electronics, you're not quite sure how serious you want to be and everything. Um, I think Adam Savage always says, you know, buy the cheapest tool that will get you by until you figure out you really need one, and then buy the best one <laughs> that you can afford. Um, and uh, so, like I said, buy yourself a, a, a used one if you can, and analog scopes are fine, just be learning and stuff like that. I recommend digital oscilloscopes. 100, 100 megahertz digital oscilloscope. So only set you back maybe two hundred dollars, and maybe you can get one even cheaper than that. But um, it's probably going to be the most expensive thing you buy originally, and um, you know you will learn a lot from from having an oscilloscope. All right. So the next thing he says is two or three scope probes. Those usually come with the, with the um, oscilloscope, um, but uh, a two channel oscilloscope is great and a four-channel oscilloscope is a real luxury. Um, so anyway, uh, and scope probes, on the high end, you can spend a lot of money on them. They usually come bundled with your, with your uh, expensive oscilloscope. But low-end scope probes, the Chinese ones for like $10, they're actually quite good. I use one all the time in my other lab inside the house, and they're just fine, they're just fine. All right, three. Uh, an analog storage oscilloscope. So this is before digital oscilloscopes he wrote this, right? So yeah, get a digital oscilloscope. Um, voltmeter. All right, so he says you need one with le at least five digits of resolution. Um, and uh, so that's certainly on the high end. I would say on the high end, yeah, get yourself a nice, a nice one. Uh, here are two uh, that I have on the high end, a, a Hewlett Packard uh, 34401. 
and a, a Keith Lee 2015. Okay, both of those are six and a half digits. So those are those are way on the high end. I paid about three hundred dollars each for for those things. Um, but uh, you don't need anything better than a uh, a, a, a little handheld meter uh, and. Uh, uh, I can hi highly recommend this one. This is an a AN870. Uh, I think you can find these for $35 or something like that, and they're great. Uh, they're, they're actually quite a, quite a few uh, digits. These are um, 20,000 count or something? I think so. Anyway, yeah, these are, these are great meters. Um, and almost any meter you get is going to be fine. Uh, it doesn't, you're not going to be limited so much by, by, your, by your voltmeter. All right, uh, let's see, what else does he say here? Um, he talks about having a high input impedance of the DVM, which they all are these days. Don't have to worry about that. Uh, okay, number five, you might want two DVMs. Um, yeah, sometimes you want to measure both current and voltage. And so uh, having, having a second one is good. So even if you have an expensive meter, you might, you might want to pick up a cheapy meter to have a second one. Uh, general purpose function generator. Okay. Uh, so I have over there, uh, uh, there, I have a Hilo Packard 33120A. Now that's a 15 megahertz arbitrary waveform generator. Um, so that's a pretty fancy high-end one. You can get uh, kind of out-of-the-box two megahertz ones. Um, that's a great one to start out with. I think you can buy one of those maybe for 80 bucks or something. Um, or you can just build your own. Um, and if you're super, super broke, just use a 555. And if you need a sine wave, just filter it. Just turn your square wave into a sine wave. Um, uh, or build one out of an op amp. Uh, find a circuit and build your own little thing. And there's kits you can buy, little Chinese kits that use uh, certain ICs, and you get a square wave, a sine wave, and a, and a triangle wave for, for, for five bucks. I mean, they're super, super cheap. So um, that's what I say on the function generator. Um, if you're lucky to have a fancy, uh, fancy oscilloscope, this one has two uh, over here. It has two function generators built into the oscilloscope. Those are both function generators and arbitrary uh, waveform recorders. So they're recorders and generators both. So um, that, is, that is on the high end. That is certain, certainly a luxury. All right, what's our next thing here? Number seven, uh, power supplies. Okay, yeah, power supplies. So um, I made a video on, on this thing that I purchased recently. Um, I really like it. It is a DP832. Um, again, I would say look for a used one. I bought this one used. Um, you know, Siglent makes them. Uh, a bunch of people make them, okay? And so those are on the high end. Those are going to cost you a couple hundred bucks. And uh, yeah, th th those are definitely on the high end. Now on the low end, I recommend getting one of these things. Um, these things here. You can get these for, I've seen them for $28. <laughs> $28 new. Um, so this is an 18 volt three amp supply. It's got two knobs, one for current and one for voltage. So it does current compliant, current limits and, and, and voltage limits. Um, and to make mine better, so here's the hack that I made mine better. This was my main power supply for years and years. In fact, I probably use that power supply more than any other power supply in the room right now. I still use it because it's just handy. Um, that's why it's sitting right in the middle. Um, I just glued, I glued this uh, meter on the front. It, it's actually sticking out about an inch. You can't tell it from the video. It's actually sticking out about an inch and it's just hot melted on there. And um, but it's a nice uh, high resolution uh, digital meter. As I think I paid like eight bucks for that or something like that. And, um, but that just makes it super good. I mean, I don't have to measure, the, if you have a kind of a cheapy power supply, you're always measuring it with a voltmeter. No, this thing, this thing is dead accurate. And so I don't have to look anywhere. I just set that number and I know that's the real number. Um, so that helped a lot. The other thing that helped a lot is I replaced this potentiometer and I replaced it with a 10 turn. And by having a 10 turn potentiometer, I'm able to set real, real accurate voltages very easily. Um, so those are the two hacks I did with, with that. Um, when I was really young and poor, um, I built my own power supply. I got a 
transformer and I built a little LM317 circuit and I had to own my own little adjustable power supply and um, yeah you can get by with uh, you can get by with pretty cheap all right what does Bob say is next number eight number eight a few RC substitution boxes ah now this one I'm gonna have to reach around and try to find so this is definitely on the low end. Um, these are pretty cheap and these just have little jumpers that you move around. And so uh, this one will do 0.1 ohms up to 100k ohms and you just set whatever value you want. It comes out here. So th this is what I would re recommend on the low end. Uh, on the high end, uh, these are super nice. Uh, they're quite pricey, uh, but they're really good. I bought this one used and it has a broken wheel. One of the switches got melted and I moved it over to the least significant digit so I don't care what it is. <laughs> but at least I have all the other ones, all the other ones working. So it'll work from, uh, from 10 ohms all the way up to uh, 10 gig ohms, 10 mega ohms. Um, so yeah, so these are really, really nice. Um, uh, and I would, I would recommend those too. Um, people have seen my other box uh, let's see if I can show it here. I uh, have a decade box up here, and that one is called the Deca box, and it's just for calibration. You wouldn't use it for troubleshooting or doing anything. That one's for calibration, but that's on the super high end uh, scale of things. All right, let's see what Bob has next. All right, the next thing Bob recommends is an isolation transformer. Uh, I think that's quite a, quite a luxury, but if you are working on high voltage circuits, it, it is a must. Um, I have one way in the back. Let me, let me take a picture of it with my cell phone so I can insert it here. Yeah, having an isolation transformer is a really, really good idea. Um, and it will save your bacon someday. So, um, yeah. Um, they come up on the used market every once in a while. I, I've bought both of mine. I had two or three of them. I bought them all used. Uh, so if you get lucky, find a used one. Um, the other thing I recommend that Bob didn't was uh, build yourself one of these. Let's see if I can turn it on. It is a, um, see, there we go. It, it measures, uh, it measures uh, volts, amps, and watts. And I have that in series with my isolation transformer so I can measure uh, things and if the amperage starts going up very fast, I'll I'll I'll, I'll shut off the uh, I'll shut off the supply. All right, and the next thing he talks about is a variac. All right, and so uh, I have a variac in series with my isolation transformer, so I can vary the voltage as well. You see, it's 119 volts right now, and I can grab my variac and I can turn it down. Right. Uh, I'm using an old lab volt uh, bench supply for like a high school lab, like high school physics lab or a chemistry lab. <laughs> it's really old school, but it has a really nice uh, variac in it, so you can vary the uh, AC AC voltage. Okay, let's see here. Next thing Bob recommends a curve tracer. Wow, <laughs> that's a real luxury. I would say, yeah, you don't need a curve tracer, um, but. Uh, I did a series of videos building your own curve tracer. I don't have a curve tracer. Um, you can build cheapy ones. Uh, anyway, I don't think you need one. I would I would say don't don't bother with a with a curve tracer. Okay, uh, spare parts. All right, all right, spare parts. You need resistors. Okay, so you need lots and lots and lots of boxes of resistors, and then you need parts. So all my ICs are over here and they start out with uh, uh, little connectors and stuff. They go into inductors and they go into ICs, TTL, then they go into analog ICs. Then they go into oscillators and crystals, LEDs, diodes, uh, more diodes, and it goes up into capacitors. And then all the way at the top, it goes into uh, potentiometers and switches. So um, yeah, so you need lots and lots of spare parts. Um, it, it, it's a luxury to have them nice and organized like this, um, but uh, just have some parts laying around. 
keeps you from going to the store all the time. The next thing he says is schematic diagrams. Um, you can get lots of those online, um, so that's no problem anymore. Um, access to an engineering or production test equipment if possible. Yeah, so this is kind of a funny thing. Um, if you actually work for a company and are able to use their equipment either off hours or borrow it and take it home, that's just a super, super luxury. Um, my very first VMA, um, back when you couldn't buy them, they were $100,000 back in the 1980s. Uh, they were super, super expensive. Um, there was one at work, and I, because I was a big boss, <laughs> I kind of abused my power and went and used the VMA in the back. Um, all right. Uh, he's, he, he talks about maybe using other things, uh, something to detect short circuits, using an AM radio as a detector, using a grid dip meter. Nobody's going to use a grid dip meter any, anymore. They're going to use a VNA or something. Um, they're going to use a probe on a, on a spectrum analyzer and stuff. Uh, let's see here. A few working circuits. By comparing a good one to a bad one, you can identify problems. Well, yeah. It's always easier to, to repair something if you have two side by side. A sturdy workbench. Yes, I have a big sturdy workbench. It is a inch and three quarters maple. I paid a lot of money for it, but a piece of plywood is fine if you don't got no money <laughs> or just use your mom's kitchen table. All right. Um, let's see here. Safety equipment. All right, safety equipment might explode, uh, safety glasses, and fire extinguishers. So I did not stage this. Uh, there are safety glasses, and there is a fire extinguisher, okay? So they are in my lab, and they were very close by. Okay, a suitable soldering iron. Yeah. Um, so people have seen my soldering iron before. Um, it is a Metcal 500. Um, the only reason I have such an expensive um, soldering iron is because they were throwing it away <laughs> and I took it home. Uh, so it is uh, very nice. It has a bunch of replaceable tips and stuff that are easy to put on. Uh, I don't remember the brand name. It, it starts with a J, I think, but there's a very popular uh, kind of a, a if you buy the real deal, it's kind of expensive, but there are clones of it that are nice adjustable uh, uh, soldering irons that you can get fairly cheap. Um, and then on the low end, uh, just get yourself some type of temperature controlled uh, uh, Weller uh, soldering iron. I had a Weller soldering iron for ages and ages. So I looked in the drawer. I still have my old Weller. Um, I had that before I was an engineer. Um, I spent some money on it. I think I spent seventy dollars for that thing, and I had no money, but I knew that I would have it for my lifetime, and I did. I had it all the way up to the to the point where I got this uh, Metcal. So, yeah, get yourself a good soldering iron. Okay, it says tools for unsoldering, desoldering, um, and uh, here's my uh, clean clean your iron out in this uh, Brillo pad stuff. Uh, get yourself some solder wick. Uh, get yourself a solder sucker. Here's a big one. Here's a here's a little one. They're on top of my bench, so I use them all the time. And then uh, the high end, if you want to spend money, get yourself a uh, uh, a desoldering tool. But they're going to spend you know you can spend like three hundred three hundred dollars to get one of those. So they are quite the luxury. I'm fortunate to have one, but uh, yeah, they're a lot of money. Hand tools, okay. Uh, I keep uh, some hand tools on the bench uh, that I use all the time. So little little diagonals, uh, little pliers, uh, exacto knife, uh, tweezers, p pencils, uh, insulated tweakers, uh, ruler. Yeah, I keep stuff right here so I can get to it right away. Uh, I keep my solder, uh, uh, my wire stripper right here. And so between those, those are the things I use just all the time, all the time. Um, uh, other things I would recommend is get yourself uh, 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 some type of measuring device or ruler or something. Um, and then directly behind me, you don't see this because it's, 
it's in the back of me when I'm doing filming, but I have a set of drawers right behind me. And so uh, I have wrenches, I have uh, uh, screwdrivers and torques, uh, pliers and wire strippers, uh, you know, sockets. So I, I have all kinds of stuff right, right behind me. Um, and so that's definitely on the high, that's definitely on the, on the high end of stuff. If you can uh, have a nice cabinet and be organized, it's always good to be organized. All right. Uh, signal leads, connectors, BNC adapters, well, blah, 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 blah. Uh, right over here, I have, uh, the jumpers and clips and BNCs and banana jack stuff all right here that I use all the time. I have another rack, another place in the, in the garage where I've got even more. Um, yeah, I keep a little, uh, I keep a little box of that 50 ohm load and, a. uh, a T connector and anyway, I keep a bunch of adapters right right in a little box right next to my oscilloscope because that's when I use them the most. Freeze mist and hair dryer. Um, I have both of those. Um, if you want to cool down a circuit or heat up a circuit to see how it behaves, it's a good way to do troubleshooting. Um, magnifying glass. I've showed that before. I always have some magnifying glasses on hand. Um, I had a video on that on how to uh, make your own because they're usually stupid, stupid expensive. Um, uh, another nice luxury is a, uh, a magnifying, uh, a magnifying light for doing soldering. I use that all the time. It's right over my, uh, right, my, right over my vice. Um, a flashlight. Yeah, uh, that's true. I use it all the time. I keep flashlight right on my bench. Uh, Thermocouple based thermometer. Yes. Um, a lot of times your DVM will have that built in. Uh, there'll be a, uh, a thermometer and you can just plug in a thermocouple right into your DVM. And so that's, that's handy. Uh, little filters in neat little boxes. <laughs> so he says you should have a bunch of R you know, low pass, high pass filters and stuff to separate signals out and stuff. I don't, I don't find that really useful. Maybe the type of stuff he did, uh, it was useful, but I don't find that too useful. Line adapters, two wire, three wire. Yeah, I've got a bunch over there. Um, and that's, that's his list. Um, what would I add to that list? Um, he never, never mentioned a, um, a frequency counter. So, uh, that can be really happy, ha handy, especially if you're working on radio stuff. He never mentioned the spectrum analyzer. Uh, that can be handy if you're working on frequency stuff. Both of those things have low end and high end. You can get a tiny SA cheap. You can get an expensive one. Uh, you can get a mid-priced range one in Siglent or Regal have thousand dollar instruments that are definitely mid-grade. Um, and yeah, I mean, what else? <laughs> That's about it. Uh... I would say uh, analog meters come in really, really handy once in a while. So that's a luxury. I've got two analog meters there and I use both all the time. Um, what else? What else? I don't know. Uh, it's good for this video. So yeah, if you're looking to put together a lab, um, you know, you can get kind of, I want that, I want that, I see everybody, you get envious, you know, try to avoid getting too envious. I mean, it's nice that it pushes you and, and makes you maybe get things and stuff, but, but don't be too envious. Um, a lot of times cheap is even better, you know, if you're going to do something and you break it, you don't mind it because it was cheap. Um, and like I said, you know, things like $30 voltmeters are just great. I mean, they're just fine. Uh, don't be shamed into thinking you need a fluke or something, right? Just don't be ashamed. Um, the cheap oscilloscopes, you know, you can either not have an oscilloscope or a super cheap oscilloscope that you're embarrassed about. Get the one you're embarrassed about. Get the oscilloscope. I don't care, right? Um, and don't be embarrassed about it. It's an oscilloscope. You know, you got one and, and you know, other people don't. Um, so, you know, don't, 
don't don't get hung up on it. I need everything the best, and you know I'm gonna be embarrassed if I got a junkie. When that's how everybody starts out. Oh my God, you you wouldn't believe the cruddy equipment that I had when I started out. I mean, my first oscilloscope was a joke. It, <laughs> it was bad, and and my. My, my power supply was, was home built and dangerous as heck because I couldn't afford putting the sheet metal around it. So it was just out in the, just wires out in the open, right? Um, so yeah, so don't, 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 don't beat up on yourself.